And now, tonight's presentation of radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. Tonight, the story of the terror and death aboard a seagoing tug in the North Atlantic. It's called Murder Aboard the Alphabet. So now, starring Vic Perrin and William Conrad, here is tonight's suspense play, Murder Aboard the Alphabet. It is well past midnight now, and I write these words so that other men may know the full story of that ill-fated voyage of the Deep Sea Tug Alphabet. Ours was not a large vessel, but sturdily built for its task. And though it seems an age, it was only a little over six months ago that we sailed from Liverpool, England, bound out across the North Atlantic to deliver our ship to her new owners, a salvage firm of Boston, Massachusetts. We put out with reduced complement, just a handful of men, Americans, and 12 in all. We were a new crew, hired by the salvage firm, and sent on board for this journey over the deep sea lanes. And I sailed as chief officer under the command of Captain Godfrey Walker, second mate Harvey Goodrum, and chief engineer Alex Fitch being the other members of our small saloon. I remember we departed on a cold, wet day with the fog lying low over Birkenhead and the northwest wind blowing fresh in our teeth as the drab gray of the Liverpool dockside dropped back into the soaking mists. I doubt if any man aboard could have foretold what lay ahead over those 3,000 miles of heaving sea. When we had cleared the lightship, I went up to the wheelhouse where Captain Walker searched the waters ahead his deep black eyes staring out from under his shaggy eyebrows. He stood there, his huge frame bundled in a salt-stained greatcoat. Ah, Mr. Marshall. Everything secured for sea? Yes, sir. Everything on deck's lashed down as tight as a whistle. Good, good. We may get a dirty crossing this time of year. She'll be uncomfortable, sir. When it comes to ships, I'm used to something a little bigger. You're a no 10,000 ton an hour, mister. If we hit it heavy, there'll be many a man on this ship who will wish he never left Darkside. I think the crew can take it, sir. Uh, maybe, mister, maybe. A few days out and we'll see. Keep on a course, quartermaster. Aye, aye, sir. All right, Mr. Marshall, you can take it now. Very good, sir. Your course is 220, south south west 220, south west See that the helmsmen keep on their course. I'll be down to my cabin if you want me. Aye, aye, sir. Funny one, the skipper, sir. Is he? Kind of gives me the creeps. <laughs> it's probably harmless enough. Used to bigger commands than this, I imagine. I guess so. But I'd keep a watch on him, sir, if I was you. Keep a watch on him? Why? Why? If you don't know now, sir, you'll find out soon enough. Check your course, mister. 220 South Southwest. 220 South Southwest. Marshland, sir, you sent for me? Yes, come in, mister, come in. I'll take a chair, mister. Thank you, sir. No, not that one. But... Over there. Certainly, sir. Is there anything wrong? No. No, nothing's wrong. I just want to talk to you. Discuss the affairs of the ship with you. Give you some idea of what I expect. Cigarette? Thank you, sir. By the way, you will not use that ashtray on your right. You will not use it. You will place your ash carefully in the other one. This one? Yes, that one. How long since you had your last birth, mister? Why, it's been some time, sir. Mm-hmm. The, uh, port captain says you know me. Only by reputation, sir. Huh. But it surprised you to learn that I know something about you by reputation, mister? Why, I... I... <laughs> we ought to make quite a pair, mister, quite a pair. Well, no matter. Now I shall tell you the reason I summoned you to my captain, Mr. Marshall. You will find that if you do not already know that I have very definite ways I wish things to be done. 
Very definite ways. First of all, I demand complete unquestioning obedience. Of course, sir. I'm sure you'll get the fullest cooperation from myself and the crew. Good, good. I want that to be perfectly clear. I also insist that your supervision of the work in this ship be done in a certain manner that I shall prescribe. All items of work will be carried out in alphabetical order. Alphabetical order, sir? Precisely. Starting with A and carrying through Z. I'm afraid I don't understand, sir. I think my meaning's perfectly clear. If the hands are working on the ship, they will start with the after deck and all other items beginning with A, then the bulkheads, then the companionways, and so forth. Do you understand me now, mister? Hey. Yes, sir. I think I understand, but I'm afraid I don't quite see your reasons. Mr. Marshall, and my reasons are not to be questioned. You will remember while I'm in command of this vessel, I hold the power of life and death. He was sitting across from me on the small settee of his cabin, his massive face half hidden in the shadows, his eyes piercing into mine. I looked about his cabin. There was something inhuman in its ordered neatness. I saw the books stacked evenly in the bookshelf. I saw the titles arranged in alphabetical order. It was a pattern, complete in itself. The desk, the bunk, immaculate, not a wrinkle or a speck of dust visible to the naked eye. On the shelf above his bunk, I saw three cameras. They also fitted the pattern, the smallest on the left, the largest on the right. Is that clear, Mr. Marshall? Yes, sir. Perfectly clear. Good, good. Now, one final thing. I insist that the quartermasters taking the wheel appear in sequence of the first letter of their surnames. Oh, but, sir, that will mean rearranging the watches. Mr. Marshland, you will do as I order. Very good, sir. The watches will be changed. That's better, much better. Well, mister, now that we understand one another, we shall cease talking about the ship. <laughs> I see you've noticed my photographs. I can't say I know much about it, sir, but I would say they're excellent. Of course they're excellent. I took them myself, a hobby of mine. You may have noticed that I have three cameras. Two of them are of German make, the other American. The medium-sized one in the middle I use with infrared film, a comparatively recent development. The other two I use for general purposes. Are you interested in photography, Mr. Marshall? I can't say I am particularly, sir. I've never done anything like that for a hobby. Very well. If you're not interested, you may go. Well, I... I didn't mean that I was. That wasn't... is an order, Mr. Marshall. You may go. I left him then and stumbled into the cold darkness outside, the thoughts tumbling unendingly through my head as I made my way to my cabin. We were pushing our way over the restless waters of the North Atlantic with a madman in command. On the morning of the third day, the second officer came running onto the bridge and flung himself excitedly into the wheels. Mr. Marshland, uh, I'd like a word with you. Well, go ahead, Goodrum. What is it? Uh, would you come outside? I, uh, I, I can't tell you here. Certainly. Now, what in the world's the matter with you? It's a radio operator, Abercrombie. He's gone. Well, you mean he's disappeared off the ship? Disappeared? Maybe. I wouldn't wonder if there was a better name for it than that. What do you mean? I mean, murder. Abercrombie was gone, vanished without a trace from the decks of the alphabet. And although I did not have the feeling myself, there was an uneasiness within the crew now. They seemed furtive, frightened, and they quietly drifted out of sight whenever the captain made an appearance on the deck. You could see they feared him, and somehow connected his madness with the disappearance of the radio operator. <laughs> That night, I stood in the darkness of the wheelhouse, the faint light from the binnacle shining on the face of Higgins as he stood his trick at the wheel. It's crazy. Abercrombie didn't just fall over the side by himself. I'll bet on it. Oh, come on, Higgins. More than one man has disappeared from shipboard, swept over the side by a sea. Sure. On a stormy night, they might, but last night was pretty quiet, sir. Just a little kiss of rain. No more. 
I've got a feeling he was pushed over. Don't be a fool. What reason would reason? any... Reason? That's the thing. No one had a reason. Except maybe him. Him? The skipper, sir. Are you accusing the captain He's of... He's not a normal man, sir. The skipper's gone off his rocker, and, and you know it as well as I do, sir. Now look, Higgins. The captain may have some set ideas about things, Alphabetical but... ideas, sir? Yes, but that... Had you thought of this, sir, then? The name Abercrombie. What of it? Beginning with A. The first letter of the alphabet. Abercrombie was the first. But you wait and see, sir. He won't be the last. You are listening to Murder Aboard the Alphabet. Tonight's presentation in radio's outstanding theater of thrills, Suspense. This is Marvin Miller speaking. In a moment, we'll return to our program. But first, here's something to think about. You know, when you buy a new fountain pen, a radio set, or an automobile, you usually get a guarantee, a signed piece of paper which promises that the merchandise will function and give you good service. And that guarantee is as good as the company that stands behind it. The same is true of our Constitution. It's a written guarantee of our freedoms, our rights and privileges. The company that stands behind that guarantee is a big one, a hundred and seventy million strong. They are named in the first three words of the Constitution, we the people. In a sense, we have had to rewrite our Constitution from time to time. We've done it by means of the amendments which have further described our basic rights. As citizens, we recognize our two responsibilities. First, to know what our rights are, and second, to defend those rights. And now we bring back to our Hollywood soundstage Vic Perrin and William Conrad, starring in tonight's production of Murder Aboard the Alphabet, a tale well calculated to keep you in suspense. Needless to say, the conclusions of the men were no surprise to me but I didn't feel the time was ripe for further action. On the evening of the following day, the barometer started dropping, and next morning saw the low gray clouds scudding swiftly before the wind, and the alphabet laboring heavily in the rising sea. It was at eight bells of the morning watch, the sixth day at sea. Who's there? It's Rich, Mr. Mate. Come in, Chief. Take a chair, Chief. What is it? You look bothered. Butterfield, mister. He's lost. Lost? That's what I said. Are you sure, Fitch? I'm sure enough. We've searched for him all around the ship, and there's not a trace, mister. Have you informed the captain? You think he doesn't know? Come on. Sir. There's another man gone, sir. Butterfield. Butterfield, sir. Huh? Aye, sir. How long have you known this, Mr. Marshall? The chief engineer informed me only a few moments ago, sir. Are you sure of this, Mr. Fitch? Yes, sir. There's not a trace of him anywhere aboard this ship. Very well, Mr. Fitch, you may go. I wish to speak to the chief officer alone. What about Butterfield, You sir? may go, Mr. Fitch. That's an order. Well, Mr. Marshland. I'm afraid this is beyond me, I'm sir. I'm not referring to the engineer, mister. He's obviously disappeared. There's nothing we can do about it. Well, why are you standing? Why don't you sit down? Well, I... I... Thank you, sir. It's Thursday. You may sit in the armchair. Thank you. Well, what do you think of my ship now? Still find her uncomfortable? No, sir. But she's small, but then any ship's a ship, huh? Although I'd like something a little more, but then... 
The says the lady that counts. Am I right? That's right, sir. You love her. Love her very much, don't you, Marshal? I do. Yes, I do. You're young, but you love her. More than anything? More than is natural? Captain, I don't see... Now that you're seated, would you like to inspect my cameras? Tell me what you think of them. I'm afraid I don't know a great deal about that sort of thing, sir. Well, you know nothing about them. Very good. You may leave my cabin. Certainly, sir. I shall look into the Butterfield matter. He has left this ship, mister. You're only wasting your time. Now go. It was that night that Higgins came to me in my cabin. I told him to sit down. I was lying on my bunk, watching him as he sat there, awkwardly twisting his cap in his hands. It... It's an unusual request, sir, and I... I hope I can speak in confidence. Go on, Higgins. Whatever you say will just be between the two of us. We think the skipper should be put away, sir. Put away? What do you mean? Locked up, sir, where he can't harm us. My... Well, that's mutiny. You can call it that if you want, sir. But Mr. Marshland... He'll murder us all. Abercrombie, Butterfield, he'll go clear on down the alphabet if we don't stop him. There's no proof. The boys are sure enough. Are they? Just give us the word, sir. We'll help you. We'll put him away. Very well, Higgins. Keep it among yourselves, but you can tell the men this. If there's any more trouble, I'll take matters into my own hands. You can rest assured of it. It had to be done very carefully. For quite a while, I lay back on my bunk, thinking of what Higgins had said. It would be risky, but the men were behind me, and that would more than sway the balance. Any court of law would see the wisdom of my action. They would never convict for mutiny, and Captain Walker would be locked away forever. <laughs> It was during the inky blackness of the seventh night at sea that death struck again on the decks of the alphabet, and another member of our dwindling band disappeared into the unknown. Abercrombie, Butterfield, and now the third man. His name was Chadwick. Who's that? Oh, good evening, sir. Dirty weather, sir. Well, I'll be getting below soon. Would you, uh, please let me by? I, uh, I want to go below. Hey, it's a hey, hey. Clumsy fool. You dropped something, sir. Never mind, I'll get it. Well, mister, up rather late, aren't you? You are too, aren't you, Captain? I thought I heard a scream. Oh, did you now, mister? Did you? We're all here, sir. You all know why you're here? Yes, sir. The boys know. We're with you, mister. We'll take care of them. Good. Now, we must do this quietly and quickly. There must be no bungling, understand? Yes, sir. All right. All right. Let's go. Yes? Captain Walker, will you come on deck a minute, sir? Well, mister, what is it you want? Come out here, sir. I want to show you something. Mr. Marshland. Never mind that, Captain. Stay right where you are. This gun is loaded. So now it's mutiny, huh? Mr. Marshland's a skipper now. Next right, right, right. Right. You'll swing for this, Marshland. You and all the rest of you. Do you really think they'll hang a mate for mutiny when they can hang a captain for murder? We 
sailed into Boston Harbor with Captain Walker lashed securely to a chair in his cabin. After the first brief struggle, he had grown quieter. During the last days of our voyage, he had just sat there silently, saying nothing. As we moved up the harbor, we hoisted the international signal calling for the harbor police. I went up to the captain's cabin and stood over him, bound there in his chair. His eyes seemed to mock me, his smile taunting. So, Mr. Marshland, this is to be the success of your little plan, huh? I have nothing to say to you, Captain. The police will be aboard at any moment. Uh, you think I'm mad, don't you? Well, maybe I am. But you bungled it badly, Mr. Bungled it badly. Have I? Yes, you bungled it, Mr. Marshland. <laughs> Why weren't you content to let me be with my madness? As I was content to let you be with yours. Yes, we'd have made quite a pair, as I told you, if you hadn't bungled it. What are you talking about? Now, I know all about you, mister. Under a bit of a cloud, huh? Haven't shipped for quite a while. Not the first vessel you've been on where men have disappeared in the black of night, huh? Yes, but I wouldn't have cared. I like your methods. Business-like. By the letter. By the alphabet. You are mad. Oh, yes, Quite. That you should have taken more interest in my photography, mister. My infrared film, for instance, that will take pictures on the darkest night. And I have one, mister. Oh, an excellent likeness. A likeness? Yes, of you, mister. The night you pushed Chadwick over the side. Now, who's that? Police. Police. Oh, come in. Come in. police have been very understanding. They understand how a man can hate and fear the sea and yet love it like a woman. Love it enough to follow it and hunger for it and make every sacrifice, even human sacrifice. But now they say they must send me away to a place where the sea can no longer torture me. A place of no land or sea or wind or rain but only rest. It is time, my son. Are you afraid? Yes. To the sea. Only to the sea. Suspense, in which Vic Perrin and William Conrad starred in Charles Terrell McNair's Murder Aboard the Alphabet. Next week, the story of a perfect fraud that succeeded only too well. That's next week on Suspense. Suspense is produced and directed by Anthony Ellis. The music was composed by Lucian Marwick and conducted by Wilbur Hatch. Featured in the cast were Farley Bear, Lou Krugman, Peter Leeds, and Jim Nusser. Suspense is another worldwide presentation of the United States Armed Forces Radio and Television Service. <laughs>